comments while I uh, have to give that brief uh, talk to another course. So, um, so in today's course, what we're going to be talking about is um, introduce introduction of a fourth sort of modeling and discussion of it how it can be hybridized with the simulation model techniques that we've already learned about within this course to address a new type of decision problem, what we might loosely call dynamic decision problems or dynamically complex decision problems, <coughs> where we need to make decisions over time in the context of uncertainty, where the consequences are of our decisions themselves have have fairly complex consequences. Consequences we can't just estimate uh, the absent simulation. So um, I'm going to be uh, introducing this uh, this work as um, by way of an example. I should note that this will be the first lecture where I consider it a hybrid use of models because I'm simultaneously going to introduce this type of modeling on the one hand and discuss how it can be used in conjunction with our simulation modeling on the other. So we're going to see an introduction of decision trees, decision trees as, a tools, as tools for making decisions. And we'll talk about them a little bit in their own right, but we will uh, more specifically be focusing for much of the lecture on how they can be combined with simulation and why you would want to do that. Okay. Um, so, um, so within today's uh, lecture, we're going to be focusing on a particular example to motivate this. And it's an example from the local context, an example that one of the students in the class is working on for her, for her thesis. And it has to do with a, a health issue, um, specifically the issue of, of West Nile uh, virus infection. How many people here in the room have heard of West Nile? Okay, just about everyone. Um, so uh, West Nile is a, a potentially lethal so potentially fatal um, uh, infection um, that uh, occurs worldwide. It started in, in Africa with a less uh, severe sort of strain, but was brought over to the United States. It seems through a zoo animal uh, in the, I believe, late 1990s. Um, and it then started to spread because mosquitoes were picking it up and and spreading it to other animals, as well as spreading it to humans. And it turns out that Saskatchewan is at the epicenter of the epidemic of West Nile virus in North America. And West Nile here in North America is more severe <coughs> than West Nile in Africa. It can lead to death, it can lead to acute flaccid paralysis, it can lead to meningitis, encephalitis, so infection of the brain, infection of the spinal cord, and uh, kills some patients, uh, depilitates others, potentially in a lifelong way. And in 2003 and 2007, there were particularly big outbreaks in this province due to West Nile bearing mosquitoes, biting people. In, in 2007, the cases registered, the known cases registered in the hundreds, I believe upper hundreds, uh, 900-ish, if, if memory serves me. 2003, the numbers were somewhat less, but Given Saskatchewan's smaller population, the fact that it's about 3% of Canadian population, the, uh, the, the percent of cases that occurred provincially within our province was, uh, was far higher than one would uh, anticipate. So I'd like to talk a little bit about this bug so that we have some sense of, where this, of, of why we need this sort of modeling to investigate this properly. So the issue is that um, uh, West Nile is a virus picked up by mosquitoes. And this particular type of mosquito, Chilex tarsalis, that is a prairie mosquito that uh, has a particularly pronounced role in spreading it. Uh, it can be spread by some other mosquitoes, but that seems to be the dominant one, at least locally. Um, and this mosquito, as mosquitoes do, they can bite many sorts of organisms, somewhat promiscuously. Um, the most important one, in this case, are what are called reservoir species. These are species that, other than, than humans, that harbor the virus 
and large enough amounts that it can both be given to them and taken from them um, and passed to other animals. So specifically the corvids, the family that includes crows, ravens, jays, and uh, uh, magpies uh, are, are a family where it can get very high levels of virus within its body. And typically they die from it. <coughs> typically they die within a few days of infection. I, be I believe it's, it's, it's a fairly short life cycle. However, during that time, if another mosquito bites them, that, that other mosquito can pick it up and can bring the virus to another organism. So they're involved in spreading it as well as getting infected. So there's this kind of cycle shown here um, going back and forth um, between the, uh, ooh, uh, thank you. Um, uh, sorry, I had missed that, um, I'd missed that uh, the recording there. So there's this cycle going back and forth um, between, um, between the, um, uh, okay, sorry, let me get this up for the remote people. I toned out on that. Um, the cycle going back uh, and forth between the mosquitoes on the one hand and the, um, and the uh, birds on the other, whereby the birds harbor this virus, the mosquitoes pick it up and bring it to other organisms. And some of these organisms are other animals, like horses, which are particularly susceptible. They can be killed. Or, or severely disabled because of this virus. But the other type of animal is, is of note is humans. Humans are dead end carriers, meaning that, that if a mosquito bites someone who's already been infected by West Nile, even potentially seriously infected, that mosquito typically can't take, that, can't take the, enough virus out of the human to then spread it to another, another host, another animal. Um, instead, Humans suffer from it, but they're not involved in spreading it. And si similarly, it seems that horses, although it's, it's very severe in its impact, they don't spread it. So it's spread in conjunction with birds, particularly corvids, um, and then it's spread to, uh, to various, um, various other animals, including humans. Now, there's a, a life cycle associated with mosquitoes, which is relevant here. So there's adults, they lay eggs, the eggs hatch into larvae, um, they become pupae, and then they become adults. And notably, the adults overwinter. They live in burrows of animals with skunks and badgers and so on, and, and hang out. And one mosquito, I'm told, can live the entire winter within these little burrows. And that's where the mosquitoes come from the next spring. They come out of those burrows, and, and then they start biting. And so if there's a West Nile harboring mosquito in the burrow, it can then start biting people in the spring. Uh, the eggs can also survive the winters. Um, so why am I telling you this? Well, it turns out that those various stages of the life cycle of the mosquito are highly dependent how quickly they play out on temperature. <coughs> so if you've ever wondered why in hot years here there's so many darn mosquitoes, it's because that whole life cycle is accelerated. So uh, I'm told by... Um, uh, someone in, who's an authority that if you raise water, uh, if you have uh, chemical reactions at room temperature and you raise the temperature by 10 degrees Celsius, that the chemical reactions and biologic reactions speed up by a factor of two. And so when there's higher temperatures, this cycle uh, from adults to eggs to larvae to pupae speeds up. There's more egg laying that goes on. The mosquitoes are more bloodthirsty, so they actually take more blood meals. They actually bite more to extract a given amount of blood. They seem to be more flighty. And it speeds up the, the maturation of the larvae and the pupae. And importantly, the virus matures faster in the mosquito's gut. So temperature, high temperature, broadly speaking, means more mosquitoes and faster maturation of the virus. It matures more quickly within a given mosquito. So the mosquito becomes infectious and in spreading it more quickly. Turns out that um, the environmental, the weather can also impact habitat availability. This is less of an issue here on the prairies because we have so many potholes with water in them around. Potholes not in the sense of street, but in the sense of, of uh, small ponds, sloughs, um, uh, on various farms, etc. And rainfall uh, is also going to be, uh, be important in some areas. Less so here. Okay, um, it turns out that 
that uh, the environment, the weather, is also important for human risk. Um, if it's really, really hot, people tend to be outside more, and they tend to wear less outside, be less inclined to wear long pants, long sleeves, <coughs> um, protective clothing, because they get too hot in the protective clothing. Um, and so for protective measures, temperature is also important. Now, the reason I'm conferring this is to convey to you an important dilemma. The dilemma is this. From year to year, the number of West Nile cases within this province varies hugely. I think this past year, we may have had one provincial case of West Nile. In 2007, I think we had something like 900 some odd cases that were known. The policy that's best for one year say a year with high temperatures, may be a terrible policy for a year with low temperatures. It may be very wasteful to go around spraying to kill mosquitoes in large amounts. If the temperature is low enough, you're just not going to see the mosquito population grow that much, and the virus won't be spreading quickly in it. On the other hand, you don't want to adopt the policy of low temperature years either. You don't want to just say, well, you know, hands off, we don't really have to worry, because in a bad year, it can be really bad. In a less bad year, it can be no worry at all. And how is a manager to decide what to do week by week to respond to this? Specifically, um, if you go look at the people at the health region, and to some degree the cities, and in the province, they have to make decisions throughout the summer on an ongoing basis given uncertainties, uncertainties regarding the size of the mosquito population, well, how it's going to develop, how quickly the, the virus is going to spread within it, so West Nile virus prevalence, and with uncertainty about how hot it's going to be. They know something about how hot it's been, but they're not sure how the temperature is going to develop. Is this going to be a cooler July or a warmer July going forward? And uncertainty about how humans are going to react, say, to an advisory. So what I'm trying to do is articulate for, here, for you here a different type of problem than we've dealt with before. What we're trying to address is a quite distinctive class of problems here. We've been focused thus far on problems that, for lack of a better term for it, and this is not any, in any, in any uh, official way a designation, making complex choices given sort of expected or typical courses uh, of important factors outside our control. So if we deal with temperature, for example, as an, as an example, we can create a West Nile model and feed it in your average yearly temperature over time. And that will get us some distance. We'll get feed in the average July temperature, the average August temperature, the average June temperature, etc. And we can try to make decisions in light of that. But that doesn't get us that far for, for problems like West Nile. For type A problems that we've been focusing on, we kind of haven't needed to consider these exogenous factors, these factors outside the model that are not predicted in the model. We've just sort of waved our hands and said, OK, we'll make some assumptions about them. But for this class of problems that we're dealing with, what I'll call type B problems, these type of dynamic decision-making, dynamically complex decision-making problems, we need to make complex dynamic choices when we can't anticipate the course of important factors outside our control, important factors like rainfall or temperature. We need to make decisions that are intelligent, that will make sense given what we see about these, these external factors, what we know about them, we can't control them. We can't control the temperature that we're exposed to directly in the short term. Um, and so we're going to need to make decisions in a way that will be different depending on whether we see, say, a very hot summer or a cooler summer. We don't want to be wasteful and assume it's going to be hot and we'll wait to put lots of money into mosquito control, nor do we want to assume and just plan on that no matter what happens, nor do we want to assume it will be cool and not take any action and be bit by a really horrendous situation with West Nile. Um, so 
you know, four type A problems that we've been talking about mostly in this class. Um, we often try to identify some sort of optimal strategy that will work under typical cases. And we think they don't have to worry that much about ex unfolding external conditions. Um, they're either known or they're not too important for what decision is most effective. Those external conditions may not, for these sort of problems, substantively change what our choice of a best policy would be. Which strategy of vaccination, who to vaccinate first, might not be so affected by the weather. But for these sort of problems we're talking about today, sort of dynamic decision problems, or dynamically complex decision problems, we have a different strategy. Rather than putting all our eggs into one basket, and say, sort of saying, we're going to assume this temperature profile. Instead of put in, in having a preset plan, instead what we're going to do is we're going to adaptively make choices over time based on our observations. Based on what we observe about the external conditions, will choose different courses of action. So based on how things are going in terms of these factors that matter to us, in this case, maybe it's temperature and rainfall, we'll do different things. We'll undertake different actions. This is very different from these, these preset plans we might identify with type A, where we kind of analyze the system and say, oh, this policy is, is consistently <coughs> best. And we just plan around it. We always plan when a pandemic comes up, you know, have vaccination in this order. Here, we've got to be really attentive, collect data on an ongoing basis, be really on the ball, and make choices over time based on our observations. So the question here is, how do we make decisions now when the choice of the best decision depends so much on what plays out and things beyond our control going forward? We may have seen something about temperature trends to this point. Suppose we're at the beginning of July, traditionally the worst month for West Nile virus um, control because it's when the temperatures are the highest and West Nile spreads most aggressively. And the largest number of cases may be infected during July. Suppose that we're in July and we've seen sort of a middling temperature range to this point, kind of on the middle of the, middle of the road. How do we decide? best what to do now. Should we go and aggressively try mosquito control and put out advisories? Or should we should we <coughs> wait and see? Wait, wait and see what the temperature has done and act then. That's that's the that's the question. Should we make our decisions now despite these uncertainties? Or should we wait and see how things play out and are trending before making our decisions? So the issue here is that um, we can't count on one future trajectory unfolding. What we do now depends considering on what will happen in the future, the future possibilities. And we have to make these decisions over time as we see things unfold. Um, and it may be advantageous to wait and see. Say, wait a minute, I don't have enough information to make an informed, judicious choice. Let's wait see how things go, and then make uh, a more intelligent decision. The ten there's a real tension here, though. Um, we have to balance this desire to seize the moment and act early. Let's, you know, a stitch in time saves nine. Acting sooner, getting that advisory out sooner, engaging mosquito suppression sooner, may yield real dividends for the rest of the summer. On the other hand, and maybe that that's all wasted effort because the temperature is going to be low early. And so we're torn between these two impulses. Let's wait and see, collect more information about what's really going to happen before we rush into a decision, a rash decision, versus seize the moment, act early, and you know, uh, be able to, to deal with the inevitable delays in rolling out a policy, et cetera. So here, what decision we make will be a reflection of, of a number of things. We'll certainly want to consider our current situation. What have we observed happening to this point? So if we're now at the beginning of July and we've seen a very hot temperature sequence till now, that may inform our choice about what to do. We think it's more likely we'll have a, a future temperature um, 
profile going forward, but equally importantly, our stocks and mosquitoes that we see right now may be higher. We also want to consider our possible future eventualities in light of what we've seen. So given the temperatures we've seen, what's the likelihood of a high temperature going forward? Our possible decision points. So well, we're going to be wanting to think about also, when's the next point I can decide? Can I decide, to, can I change my mind tomorrow? If so, maybe waiting <coughs> another day will afford me a little bit more insight without much harm. On the other hand, if this is my last chance to decide for the entire summer, it has weight to it. It has consequences. Maybe I want to minimize my tail risk by acting now to just offset the possibility. So here we're balancing these two, two desires. Um, now the issue here is the seize the moment, acting early, th the risk there is we may find it's all worthless. We've acted early, we've invested, and it's useless. For wait and see, we may get bit in the butt because by the time we go to act, it may be too late. Too late. Cat's out of the bag, as we'd say. The cat's out of the bag. The, uh, the, the situation has, has reached a point where we can't do much. And indeed, by later parts of July, that's the situation. We start to see human cases creeping up. And if we wait to see that, if we wait to see human cases coming, I'm told by those in authority here, it's really too late. Game over. You've waited too long. You can't really <coughs> head it off because there's large numbers of people probably already infected. You're not going to be able to undo that. And the damage has been done, essentially. You could act now, but the temperatures will be cooling anyway, and it may have a very marginal impact. So waiting and seeing can cause big problems because of the natural delays associated with the system. Um, it may be like vaccinating people after half the population has already been infected. It's, it's not going to confer much difference in how quickly herd immunity is acquired. Seizing the moment, on the other hand, may be, may be wasteful. So what we're going to do today is to look at a, a hybrid architecture that tries to deal with these tougher problems. These problems where we have uncertainty over time, where we have to make choices over time, and where there are consequences for our choices. So here we're going to have a simulation model, and we're going to have a decision tree. And the decision tree is going to inform the simulation model about events and decisions it's made. And the simulation model is going to spit back consequences. So before doing this, I'm going to introduce the fourth element of modeling. Now this, this element of modeling is not per se, it's not a simulation model. It's unlike system dynamics modeling, agent-based modeling, or discrete event modeling, in the sense that it's not a dynamic model per se. This is not a model of state of a system evolving over time. We're not simulating out a system. But it is a, syst uh, a tool for reasoning about choices over time and events in the, in the context of uncertainty over time where there's consequences to it. Decision trees by themselves are extremely useful. We're going to be focusing for most of this lecture on use of them together with simulation. But they're valuable in and of, of their own right. And I routinely use them in decision making when I have a, a choice I have to make. I know maybe a series of choices over time I can make and some uncertainties. So we're going to use uh, decision trees here both for diagrammatically illustrating decision making and for qualitative reasoning. And they're going to represent flow of time, decisions, uncertainty, and consequences. Okay, Consequences to us. So within a decision, a decision tree is, um, <coughs> diagrammatically, it's a, a branch hierarchical structure. It's a tree um, that has a variety of sorts of nodes. We're going to have decision nodes, which are shown in with blue squares. And a decision node has one or more children. These children represent possible choices. You choose which decision you're interested in. And the goal of the decision tree 
of large goal of the decision tree is to advise us at a given point, given our assumptions, which choice is most effective. Which choice, choice will yield the greatest benefit? Okay. Again, within the context of our assumptions. The second major component of the decision tree is an event node. And an event node is, is quite different. A decision node we have, cho we have control over. We can choose which of those outcomes will occur. By contrast, an event node, we don't have control over which outcome can occur. What we're going to have to live with the possibility any of these outcomes can occur. What we do is we further associate information with each of these children, each of these paths underneath the event node that we, we didn't have for the uh, decision tree, or for the decision node. Um, so uh, spe specifically, we have uh, these probabilities here, 0 0.5, 0 0.3, and 0.2. Okay? Um, these probabilities indicate uh, the likelihood, if you've reached this point where an event's going to occur in the tree, with probability 0.5, it's going to be consequence 1, possibility 1. Maybe this is low temperatures for the next week. Uh, with probability 0.3, <coughs> it's going to be po possibility 2. Maybe that's medium temperatures, you know. So maybe, maybe possibility 1 is temperatures closest to 20 degrees Celsius. This is temperatures closest to 25 degrees. And possibility 3 is temperatures closest to 30 degrees Celsius. So that's a set of discrete possible outcomes associated with this event. The final type of node is, excuse me, a terminal node. A terminal node represents some sort of consequence. It's the leaf nodes in the tree, OK? So I'm going to use an example here um, that's going to uh, illustrate this. And forgive me, it's, it's not um, for this particular example. but. Um, in this case, we have a choice to make. Um, so if we're rolling out a software project, um, do we, and we anticipate there's going to be an operating system change, like over to Windows 8, and we, we're wondering, OK, should we roll our system out in a way that does rely on those new features or not, we could construct a decision node here. This, uh, this is illustrated uh, here. And um, in this decision, we can have one of two choices. We can ship our product in a way that does not rely on new OS features, in which case we don't really um, worry about whether the OS is the new OS is delayed, or we can rely on them, <coughs> in which case if the new OS ships on time, we may benefit, but if it's delayed, we lose. So here we have a decision node. We have an event node that only applies if we make this decision of relying, then we have to deal with this consequence. And then we have consequence nodes that show that if you have this scenario playing out, you've made this choice, this event has happened, this particular event has happened, what's the consequence? Well, here you've lost $200,000. Otherwise, if this event occurs, you've gained $50,000 net. Okay. Um, now, one of the ways we use these decision trees is we do what's called a rollback on the tree. So we use the tree, once we associate probabilities, we specify the choices, the events, and the probabilities associated with outcomes, and the terminal nodes to specify the consequences, the outcomes given each, each uh, scenario. We, perform, we can perform what's called rollback of the tree. And this is associated, for those of you who are familiar with this notion of dynamic programming. Um, so it's a very simple procedure. It's also called uh, backwards induction. Um, it's related to Bellman's dynamic programming, which is used in lots of algorithms. And basically, um, it's a bottom-up computation from the tree. So for a terminal node, the value, the rollback value, is simply the value associated with a terminal node. For an event node, <coughs> you take the expected value of the children. And for a decision node, you select whichever child offers the best value. So typically, we'd say the highest value. And you pass that up as the value of the tree, because that's something you can choose. For an event node, you can't choose the outcome. You have to deal with all possible outcomes. For decision nodes, you can choose. So in this case, if we're trying to decide what our choice should be up front here, should we rely on these features or not, 
Um, here we would need to say, okay, we'll do a backwards induction. So we have this uh, minus 200,000 here, 50,000 here. We have a 10% chance of it being delayed and 90% of chance of it be shipping on time. And that will give us a net outcome here, an expected value of 25,000. Where did this come from? Who can tell me where this came from, 25,000 there? That's the probability by the dollar outcome. Yeah, so, so exactly. So 0.1 times 200,000, right? Uh, so that's 20,000 plus 0.9 times 50,000, that's 45,000. You, uh, excuse me, this is negative 20,000 because 20, it's minus. This is, in parentheses, this means negative. Um, so that's it, it's <coughs> minus 200,000. So, so it's 0.1 times minus 200,000 is minus 20,000 plus 0 0.9 times 50,000, which is 45,000. You sum, you have 45,000 minus 20,000 is 25,000. And here, this other alternative, so the net gain of this, the expected gain is $25,000. That takes into account the possibility that you're exposed, 10%, and the consequence of that, plus the, the possibility that you won't be, it won't be delayed in the gain from that. And so the net, the best choice here is what? The best choice here is to, in fact, rely on these features. You get a net gain of 25000 compared to a net gain of, of, of zero here. Um, so even though you're exposed, you can uh, have a net gain. So you know you could expand these decision trees to have several different levels. Um, so here we could, for example, decide, OK, do we rely on the new OS features? If so, if it is delayed, do we ship? Go ahead and ship anyway so it's, it's available for customers, or do we wait for the final OS release for a final set of testing? And here you have two layers of decisions. Now in our, our case, uh, and we can do the rollback for that as well. Um, so here what we're doing is we're using decision trees to identify op what are called optimal decision rules. And this is an optimal in light of our, of our assumptions. So essentially what a decision rule is doing is it's suggesting to <coughs> us what we should do given any possible eventuality. So what our sequence of choices should be um, uh, for despite any sort of eventuality. So, um, you know, if we, I'll, I'll come back to this example here, if we reach this point, for example, where the OS is delayed, we'll have some understanding of what we should do in that case. If, on the other hand, but it also gives us a recommendation what to do up front. So, no matter where we explore in the tree, we should be ready by knowing what we should do. That's what a decision rule will specify. It'll tell us for this sequence of events, observed events over time, if it's consistently cool in the summer, this is best. If it's consistently hot, do this. If it's medium temperature now, you know, for now do this, and then wait a few more weeks before you decide whether to do X, Y, or Z. Okay, so decision tools, uh, trees can be used to try to identify optimal decision rules. And and it tries to specify what we should do given any possible eventuality. Okay, so in this case, and again, apologize, I should have uh, uh, should have updated this slide, but we can imagine here with each decision where it says expand capacity, no expansion. The expand <coughs> capacity is um, is perhaps here, um, you know, undertake issuing an advisory or undertake. Uh, source reduction for mosquitoes to eliminate mosquito habitat or other mosquito uh, interventions. Um, so here we might have an initial decision and then we wait and we see what plays out in terms of mosquito populations or, mos or temperatures and then we have another set of decisions perhaps a week later. And indeed in the health region just downtown here and in health regions elsewhere in Saskatchewan you have what are called bug busters meetings. And every week they, week, they meet to review, okay, what has the temperature been till this point? Where are we at now in terms of how much West Nile virus we see in among mosquitoes? How are we now in terms of temperature or mosquito counts? And they decide, okay, should we undertake an intervention or should we hold off? Should we issue an advisory or not? That's literally a week by week 
um, decision that's that's made. So I'd like to introduce some some terminology for dealing with decision rules. And this is this is abstracted away right now from the whole issue of simulation. We'll see where that comes in in a little bit. But I'm talking now about these decision trees. And in the context of these decision trees, we speak about decision rules as this mapping from from events and decisions which have previously occurred to what to do now for this decision. For any given decision, if you reach that point in the decision tree, what should you do? That's what a decision tree, well, a decision rule will give you. And there's two types of decision rules that we can delineate here. One is a static decision rule. And this type of decision rule will pursue the same set of predetermined decisions regardless of eventuality. It stays the course. It just sticks to the same choices no matter what is observed. So it would be as if the health region here decided, look, before the summer begins, whatever happens in terms of temperature, we don't have time to monitor that and so on. We're just going to issue advisories. We'll put advisories on TV and in the paper and you know on, on our websites. We'll send out news releases, etc. on this schedule and we'll engage in source reduction and larva siding. That's what we're going to do no matter what happens. That's an example of a static decision rule. They stick to the same plan no matter what is observed. An adaptive decision rule is something quite different. It varies its decisions, its actions, the choices that are made based on what events have, uh, have occurred. That is what things have been observed. So if you have observed this, do that. And this is actually what the health region does. This is what the province does. They observe week by week. <coughs> they observe these things, they talk about it, and they try to act. The observation here is that static decision rules are rarely optimal. When you have a situation where the outcome is strongly influenced, the effectiveness of a given policy is strongly influenced, by factors outside of your control. It's rarely effective to just stick to the same plan. Instead, you should be watching what's going on and making your choices according. It'd be kind of like trying to drive to Regina with your eyes closed. It'd be a very unadvisable decision rule to try to drive down, um, even if you think you know the route well. You need your eyes open to inform your choices. And there you're going to want to use feedback. And this is where simulation will come in. OK, so let's talk about a static decision rule. We'll, we'll illustrate a static decision rule in the context of the decision tree. And I apologize, this should say, again, instead of expand capacity and no expansion, we should really say undertake intervention versus no intervention. You know, undertake uh, issue advisory versus you know, wait and see. Um, and this could be high early growth of mosquito population, low early growth, or high early growth of temperature versus low, low early growth, uh, what have you. Um, so this is an example of a static decision rule. Why do I say it's static? Can anyone pick out for me why this decision rule, this set of choices that's recommended, that's shown here, why is that, why do we say it's a static decision rule? What is it that, so, so it's shown in bold, that's the decision rule, that shows graphically sort of the decision rule we're dealing with. It says, make this choice here at the initial decision, make this choice here, and make this choice here. Why do I say it's a static decision rule? What, what distinguishes this as static? What distinguishes that as static? Yeah, they always choose to, here the, the analogous thing would be to undertake an intervention. Maybe it's ish larviciding. No matter what, what's observed for temperature or mosquito population, whatever this uncertainty is, they're always making the same choice here, right? They're always choosing the same thing. So. So that, that's an example of a static one. Here's an adaptive one. How do we know this is adaptive by the same token? Yeah, 
yeah, so, so if the mosquito population is growing slowly, for example, or temperature is low, <coughs> we might not undertake an intervention, otherwise we do. These are two different decision rules illustrated. Decision rule, so if you reach this point, it says to do this. Now, you'll notice I haven't specified what to do up here. That's because it's telling us to do something different, you know, so we always go this way. We, we have a choice of what to do at decision points. We don't have a choice of what we have to handle at events. We can't control the outcome of this uncertain event. So here, for example, we have to be able to deal with the possibility that we may undertake an intervention, and it could be high temperatures, it could be low temperatures. It could be high temperatures here or low temperatures. Um, so here we've seen sort of static decision rules, and, um, and it turns out that these are uh, very, very uh, powerful tools. So just using decision, decision trees can be a very powerful mechanism for informing your choices <coughs> over time. You can sketch out your decision problem. You know, should I, should I get a new car? I'm not certain if my car will survive through the winter. It's, you know, it, it may conk out in the middle of the winter and then it'll be a real pain to, to have to go get a new car. On the other hand, it may last the winter. And, you know, if, if I have to get a new car, I may end up pa paying a premium for it. It will cost me time. You could put a cost associated with these things and use it to inform your choices. Choices and uncertainty over time in the context consequence of, uh, in the context of uncertainty. So these decision trees are powerful and very general analysis tool. Um, and it turns out that decision tree packages out there, so there's a couple of them. There's one that's called TREAGE, T-R-E-E-A-G-E. -E -E. It's a very popular um, tool. There's another uh, crystal ball, for example, that works with Excel. Um, and these are very powerful tools for making choices over time. Um, and it turns out several of them support symbolic components. You can have uncertainties, instead of associating those probabilities of a given outcome that's fixed, you can associate a variable like PL with it, and then vary PL. And it turns out by doing that, you can get, you can do sensitivity analyses, do what's called value of information, and, and select uh, strategies. So for example, you could ask, okay, what would the probability of the OS being delayed have to be to make it instead desirable for me to instead not rely on it? Or what would the, the probability have to be of, you know, um, there being bugs in the new OS for, for me to do, um, to have to wait for it to do regression testing? Um, so here, for example, we could vary two types of probabilities within the tree and show for different <coughs> regions of the assumptions about those probabilities in the tree which strategy is best, which decision is best at a given point. This is an example of the sort of sensitivity analyses that you can do with decision trees. We're going to be coming back to decision analyses in any logic with the three sorts of modeling we've looked at, but this is in a way a sneak preview of showing sensitivity analysis with respect to our probabilities in the decision tree. And this is very powerful because it's highlighting for us kind of the ranges of uncertainty where we need to make one decision or another. Um, and sometimes we care about multiple attributes. Maybe we care not only about human, um, you know, the human consequence of West Nile infection, but we, sit, we also want to save costs. Um, maybe we care most about, you know, the quality of life and, and length of life, but we, we want to lower cost as well. Um, so it turns out terminal and decision trees can can capture these factors. You can create co weighted combinations of these, combine them, and there's a whole area called multi-attributed decision analysis, which takes these into account. So what we're going to talk about, however, here is going beyond this basics of decision trees. Decision trees are great decision-making tools, but what they don't capture is dynamic complexity. They don't capture feedbacks, uncertainties, I see the feedbacks, delays, <coughs> nonlinearities, um, and, and large amounts of heterogeneity. They don't allow us to capture emergent behavior of a system over time. So what we're going to look at today is combining simulation models on the one hand 
with decision trees on the other. And we're going to try to knit them together. And given the time, we'll probably have to bleed into next, um, the next uh, lecture. But we're going to talk about fusing them in a way that um, you'll find uh, is, is, has been very, very little tapped into. Um, this, this is uh, a very, uh, very novel approach. Um, OK, so um, we're going to focus on a hybrid approach, brings together a simulation model. Any of the sorts of simulation model we've captured thus far can be folded into this. So you can use it with discrete event modeling. You can use it with agent-based modeling. We can use it with system dynamics modeling. Now, uh, one of the members of the class, who unfortunately is not feeling well right now um, and can't be here, on one e, um, she normally sits uh, right over there. She's actually built software to bring these two together for Benson, but she hasn't done it for any logic yet. She's working towards that, or uh, she will be working towards that. Um, but um, I want to talk about this hybrid approach, how it works conceptually, and then we'll uh, uh, we may take a look at how how it's actually applied with with Benson. And so this is a framework that's geared towards an ongoing process of observation decision making. So um, it's capturing this element of decision trees where we're observing things over time and making decisions accordingly. Um, it simulates a broad range of possibilities um, for, for outcomes. So here for West Nile, for example, we'll be simulating a wide variety of possible temperature profiles over time. Not just one. We wouldn't be trying to find out the best decision to put into place about what intervention to use. Do we larvicide? Do we issue an advisory? Do we do nothing for West Nile for some fixed temperature sequence? Instead, we look at a wide range and we figure out what to do for each of them. Under this condition, we'll do this. So we can be poised to trigger the right, the right action under the right circumstances. Um, and we're going to do that in a staged way. We're going to do it in an incremental way. So week by week, based on what's going on, based on the observation, what do you do next? Um, and some of these decisions could be wait and see. We're going to wait. We're going to collect more information. We're going to learn about what's transpiring and then undertake things accordingly, taking into account that trade-off that we may be really pushing the envelope. And the approach here can be used for diverse uh, challenges. We're using it here for, um, for uh, you know, health policy, but it's equally applicable for industrial decision making. Um, some of the, the types of work that Darian is doing, for example, with his um, you know, road building, uncertainty about how things will play out in, in terms of oil field development, very much fall, fall under these lines. So what's the basic um, division of responsibilities in this? Well, it's a divide and conquer. We, we break up the responsibilities of handling different components of this into two different pieces. And there's, the two pieces are a decision tree on the one hand and a simulation model on the other hand. And each of them has a set of responsibilities. So the decision tree represents sequences over time of uncertainties and decisions. And it, it's, it represents a set of choices, uncertainties, and consequences. Uncertainties are represented in event nodes, decisions and decision nodes, and consequences in terminal nodes, <coughs> just like we've seen. These outcomes could be cost, they could be quality of life, they could be quality adjusted life years lived, they could be, they could be um, you know, number of deaths or minus number of deaths, so, so um, a larger number is, is, is better. Um, and really, the decision tree here is kind of taking care of encapsulating, of capturing policy space. It captures sort of different possibilities and what decisions you'd make under them. It captures all uncertainties. It encapsulates them. It, it, it makes it so that the simulation model doesn't have to worry about them internal. It doesn't have to worry about the uncertainties associated with temperature. Instead, that its simulation models can be responsible for calculating the dynamic consequences, the consequences over time of a sequence of events, so uh, say temperature outcomes, 
So was the temperature hot during this week? Was it cool during the next week? The simulation model is going to take care of simulating the consequences of heat and high temperatures in this week, cool temperatures in the next week, and of choices. Okay, and week three, you know, large sliding is applied, and week four, an advisory is issued. What's the consequence of that? It does a simulation of that and arrives at some consequence. Some some costs, perhaps, quality of life, quality of just years live, uh, life years live, number of people have gotten infected, number of people have died, number of hospitalized patients, whatever. Whatever you want to use in your decision tree, the simulation model will take care of calculating that. Okay, so um, for our case, for, for this case, we might have the simulation model responsible, for example, for representing the dynamic features of the situation mosquito life cycle the bird life cycle transmissions between mosquitoes and birds. We know how to do that in a simulation model. We know how to do it, in fact, in a, in a Venza model. We know how to do it in an in a agent-based model, you know, stock and flow or agent-based. We, we can do that. Um, we can represent human infections and disease progression. And we can factor in cost, etc. cetera. Um, for decision tree, we can represent Instead, decision options over time. Um, so this might be things like source reduction, larvicide, vaccinating, wait and see, adult deciding. These are all types of anti-West Nile virus interventions typically undertaken either with respect to people, like an advisory, or with respect to mosquitoes, like reducing the source habitat or larvicide, and people also vaccination. There's also uncertainties to represent in the decision tree temperature. Temperature, again, being critical because it affects mosquito maturation. How many generations of mosquitoes play out during the summer? Is it six or is it three? It'll make a big difference for mosquito counts and the risk for humans. That's all captured in the decision tree as far as you know, temperature uncertainty and then the consequences that are passed by the simulation model. So let's, let's talk, uh, talk a bit about these. So the West Nile virus system dynamics model, this is something one E is working on. Um, it was uh, previously built up uh, by a couple of generations of students as well as myself. I'll provide it to the class in case there's interest. Um, but basically what we have here is we have a set of representation of mosquito life cycle. Eggs, pupae, and larvae, and um, susceptible adults, exposed adults, and infectious adults. And um, these are mosquitoes. And these mosquitoes then bite birds. And there's actually representation of birds. And then there's, there's humans as well. So there's a sort of stage representation of birds um, that distinguish a juvenile from adults because it's easier to bite juvenile birds. Mosquitoes seem to like their tender flesh. Um, and then we have humans in terms of uh, progression of, of human cases. Then we have a decision tree. So here what we have is decision nodes choosing between different outcomes, do nothing, source reduction, larvicide, et cetera. And then we have uncertainties, more or less immediately after these decisions. Time is running down here on the x-axis. More or less immediately after this choice, we have some uncertainty about how temperature will play out in the next week. So we observe what the temperature is. Is it hot or is it cool? If it's hot, we have another set of choices to be made. If it's cool, we have, we have choices to be made in either case. Now our choices up here, if we have an adaptive decision rule, our choices up here for a cooler past week might be very different from our choices from a hotter past week. Why? Because there's larger mosquito populations for a hotter week, the mosquito virus penetration may be higher, and the fact that our last week was hot might mean there's a higher likelihood of hot weather going forward. <coughs> so for all those reasons, we might, we might choose something different for each of these, um, each of these decisions here. So with, a, with an adaptive decision rule, we might, we might choose something different for this outcome than for, or for this decision than for this decision. And eventually this plays down and we have a set of terminal nodes. Maybe this is after week 12 the end of the summer, we have a set of consequences. And these consequences are going to depend, 
This is important. A given consequence here will depend on the sequence of decisions and of events that have occurred from the root on down. So let's, let's take this consequence. This consequence was shaped here by this choice, this, this sort of outcome, a higher temperature here, this choice here, and then this, this sort of lower temperature here, and then it looks like this choice of larviciding here, and, and then this, this temperature outcome, if I've got the right one. The point is it depends on this particular path over time. And when the simulation model is going to calculate that consequence, it's going to calculate, simulate out what happens when you choose this at this time, when this temperature starts, you know, it's higher temperature in the first week, and then you, you choose this other thing, and then it's lower temperature, da, da, da. And it's going to arrive in the end at some number of human cases, for example. And it will associate that with the terminal node. Okay? Um, so uh, there's a... There's a package, as I mentioned, that, that 1E has built uh, where you can actually select a decision tree built in and, and Vensim, excuse me, a simulation model built in Vensim. And you can then specify for this tree um, the number of layers of the tree, the start time of the tree, um, what's the decision node variable that you want to, how do you tell the decision, tr the, the simulation model what um, decision has been made at a given point and what are the different possible outcomes of that. So you might list several possible outcomes. And then you can, um, you can specify, okay, what value of the decision of the simulation model should be used, what variable should be used for the terminal nodes, and then what variables associated for encoding the events over time in the simulation model. And uh, as a result of this, um, the, uh, there'll be a decision tree created, which can then be run uh, automatically by the software. And it may run Bensim a thousand times, may run it 50,000 times in order to evaluate this decision tree. And it eventually it will arrive at something like this, although with a much bigger tree potentially. And critically, for every decision node here, it'll have a recommendation. So given everything that's occurred till this point, and all these uncertainties going forward, and all these possible future choices that could be made, what's the best choice now? Given that you will later have a chance to make a choice, say down here, whoa, um, whoa uh, have a chance to make a choice down here, what's the best choice to make here? It will consider all that and come back through this rollback procedure with a recommendation of what to do if you reach this decision point. So in the context of a world where uncertainties are sometimes pronounced, this can be very valuable. And it's valuable in the decision tree, uh, in the West Nile context in particular. So um, here we specify it. Uh, there can be a tree. And there can be a, a, a tree uh, created as a result. So uh, this tree will then be evaluated with the, um, with the rollback. And you'll have estimated values associated with each choice here that will lead it to recommend which choice is better. So what's the expected sort of gain or the expected loss associated with each possible choice? So you might associate each of these terminal nodes, for example, with a minus of cost, where that cost takes into account um, healthcare cost as well as um, cost associated with an intervention. Minus because you want to choose the thing which has the highest value, so it has the least minus value. If it's close to zero, it's really good. And and for each choice here, there'd be some <coughs> indicated value, expected value associated with um, with that outcome. So if you choose to do nothing here, this is the expected sort of uh, cost in terms of say uh, total cost. If you choose the larva side, this is the expected cost. So we've now built these decision trees um, for quite some large trees. So our, our largest one thus far has been, I think, 46,000 nodes or something along the 46,000 terminal nodes um, at the end, many more internal nodes. Um, 
excuse me, a comparable number of internal nodes, and uh, and it can give recommendations, you know, back to the source procedure. So this is a route to achieving ongoing decision making. Potentially, you know, every two weeks is what we've examined um, for decision making, and it allows you to build together the outcome of the simulation model. Now we focused here on Benson as the simulation model. There's no reason this couldn't be done for an nature based simulation. There's no reason it couldn't be done for a discrete event simulation. So for example, uh, the costs associated with these might be uh, similar or different. So for an nature based simulation, you might total up total costs and that as well. Um, for a discrete event simulation, you could use costs. You might use average you know, length of time or requires a patient to be treated and use that and you might do minus of that so you try to make it as close to zero as possible. Um, so, you know, a smaller value for delays associated with the patient care is better. And you find out in this context sort of what choices to make under different situations. So, if you have a problem that involves substantive external uncertainty, uncertainty outside your model, if the decisions are plausibly highly determined by those outside factors, and you want to create policies, choices, strategies for decisions such that they are robust, they are resilient, they work well, depending on regardless of what eventuality plays out in the external world that's not under your control, this hybrid scheme can be very attractive. So if, you, if you're very uncertain about, about when a vaccine will arrive in your city, for example, or you're very uncertain about how much economic development there will be in this area of land for your road development, or if you're interested in you know, protecting against uh, computer virus infestation and you're not sure you know, how... Um, how development of viruses against Android will proceed. You might use a strategy like this to identify a systematic incremental rollout strategy for the firm or for the public health system or what have you that will be able to handle any of these uncertainties but won't be caught, caught in an exposed position if things don't go as most likely case. It'll be able to handle a wide variety of cases in a robust fashion. The beauty of combining it with simulation modeling is that the simulation model will inherently build in a representation of the delays. And this is important because I talked earlier about this tension that's in place between deciding earlier a stitch in time saves nine but is potentially wasteful because you might do something that turns out not to be needed between the tension between that on the one hand and the desire to wait and see, to observe what happens. Which one you err toward or which one you prefer of those will depend a lot on how nimbly or how quickly your choices will have their effects. How nimbly you can, you can choose and, and change the situation. So in other words, um, uh, if it turns out, for example, that, that by, un by undertaking your interventions, you can very quickly, um, very quickly lower the burden of, of West Nile um, bearing mosquitoes, um, you might want to delay, wait and see until the population of mosquitoes is very high, and then undertake that intervention. But if it turns out there's long delays associated with fighting mosquito populations, that won't be a very effective strategy. And the simulation model can capture that. It can capture that behavior over time. It can simulate out that intervention. How long does it take to do source reduction? How long does it take to go and, and spray larvicide or, or adulticide or what have you? Um, it, can, it can capture that in there. Adult uh, larviciding, for example, is going to have an effect, but that effect will pl play out only over a larger period of time because you're affecting larvae. You're affecting mosquitoes in the early phase of their life. So sure, it may reduce mosquito numbers, as will source reduction. Um, 
but it will do so only gradually because it, it basically kills the larvae and those larvae wouldn't have hatched into full-blown mosquitoes for another perhaps two weeks or something. So it will have effect, but it's a delayed effect. And our simulation model can capture that. It can capture those characteristic delays. So building together simulation models, capture the delays, the feedbacks, the nonlinearities, the complex dynamics on the one hand, and decision trees, which capture the uncertainties, the choices to be made, and, and uh, capture the ability to do this rollback to identify the best decision rules, a very powerful combination. So that's what I want to talk about today. Um, in our next lecture, we'll be looking more broadly at the issue of hybrid modeling, hybridizing the sorts of models that we've built thus far, my stocks and flows, agent-based models, <coughs> and discrete event models, so that um, we can we can play to their both their best strengths for each of them. How do we combine them so that they they yield the gated, greatest gain collectively, and so they complement each other's weaknesses? That's what we look at more next time. This is just the first example of, of a hybrid technique. So we'll see some more next time, and uh, then we'll be going on and discussing some general types of processes that apply across all all these dynamic modeling types, including calibration sensitivity analysis, debugging, visualization, getting data in and out of the model, and those sorts of important components. Okay? So, that's all for today. And I'm hoping within the next day to finally send you back your uh, PSET 1, um, which I'm just going over, sent it earlier by the TA for this week, and so I'm just going over it. I'll try to get that back to you in the next day. Thanks very much. Yes? Uh, uh, Friday morning? Oh, uh, these, oh, yeah. Okay, just me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two people missed the change of time, so. Y y yeah, it um. It was originally Thursday, then I emailed.